afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Roxy. I'm from Alzheimer's Orange County, and I'm the Memory Programs Coordinator. Today, I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, I'll be teaching you the part two of Brain Health series. We'll be talking about the importance of sleep for cognition. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Irvine Clinical Research. They're an independent medical clinic in the city of Irvine, and they provide all kinds of interesting investigational interventions and medications and screenings. So if you are interested in finding out what they do, please visit their website at irvineclinical.com. Again, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. You're all placed on mute. The best way to ask a question anytime during this presentation is to type it in the chat box, and either myself or my co-host will be able to see and respond. Okay, so let's dive into this topic of sleep. So sleep affects our overall brain health and our overall health, including our hormones, our immune system, and it's essential for the proper functioning of literally every single organ in our body. So today we'll be talking about all things related to sleep, how it's linked to cognitive health, and how you can improve your own sleep hygiene. So I'm very excited to be talking to you about this. Let's talk about the goals for today. So our goals are to understand age-related changes in memory and learning. We'll review the six pillars of brain health, learn how your sleep is related to cognition and healthy brain, and we'll learn how to protect your brain and lower your risk for developing cognitive decline. So first, let's talk about normal age-related changes in learning and memory. I think it's so important for us to include this slide in every single one of our presentations because it's essential for us to know what's normal and what's not normal for um, changes relating to learning and memory. So it is normal and it is common for us to see increased difficulty finding words. And we talk about this phenomenon as the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Young adults experience it as often as once a week and older adults experience it as often as once a day. So it is very common. You may also see more problems in multitasking. And we talk about how the brain is actually not designed to multitask. And when we multitask, we are actually hurting our brains because we're rapidly switch on, switching our focus from one activity to another without devoting all of our attention and concentration to one activity. So it's important to be mindful and try to reduce multitasking as much as possible. You may also find mild decreases in the ability to pay attention. Recall is slower with age. And unfortunately, our brains change just like the rest of our bodies as we age. It may slow down in speed. Um, we may see changes in recall. And this is um, our ability to pay attention is affected. And we talk about how important it is to practice paying better attention because the first step in creating a memory is paying attention. And it requires a lot of skill, but it is something that you can master through practice and memory training. There's good news. You can still learn new things. You can still create new memories and you can still improve vocabulary and language skills. So if you're reading this and you're thinking, this is me, I'm experiencing all of these changes, you're not alone, right? These changes are normal. Um, but if you are starting to see that this is affecting your daily life, then maybe it is time to check in with yourself about what you're feeling and what you're going through. And maybe it's time to talk to your primary care physician about this. And we also offer memory checks mind checks here at Alzheimer's Orange County, and you can get a better idea of your memory. So it's about 30, 45 minutes that we spent with you. It's done via Zoom. It's virtual. You do it from the comfort of your own home. And basically, you get to see if the changes that you're experiencing, is it normal um, or does it warrant concern? So we do have that available for you, and you can sign up for that by calling our helpline. I'll give you more information at the end but these are just some common changes that you may be experiencing. So when it comes to sleep, AARP conducted a national survey of representative older adults, and they found out that 99% of adults over the age of 50 believe that sleep is very important for their health and for their brain. However, 43% say that they don't get enough sleep, 
54% report that they wake up too early in the middle of the night and they can't go back to sleep. And 44% say they rarely or never sleep throughout the night without waking up for more than a few minutes. And it's very difficult for them to go back to sleep. So as you can see, we are a very sleep deprived society. This is an area that we all need work on. We all have room for improvement, especially during this pandemic. Um, when we are experiencing additional stressors and anxieties and different everyday tensions that may impact our ability to get that quality deep sleep that our brain and body desires. So let's move on and talk about the six pillars of brain health. We talk about how important it is for us to love our brains and to protect our brains. And this is coming from the Cleveland Clinic. These are six ways that we can protect our brains everything related to what we eat, how well we eat, how we exercise, how well we exercise, how we stimulate our brains and how we exercise our brains, our medical health, how well we control our risk factors, how well we um, take control of our health, how well we sleep, how much we sleep and how well we uh, exercise um, and relax. And also social engagement. That's also very important and critical, but it's especially critical um, as you age because it can be life affirming. But these are six ways that you can love your brain. Today we'll specifically be talking about sleep and relaxation. So let's talk about some changes to sleep as we get older. So sleep becomes less deep and there are more awakenings, and you may start to see this from experience. Sleep becomes more vulnerable to disturbances, and this may, may be related to environmental factors, or this can be related to certain medications that you are taking. It can also be related to poor lifestyle factors, such as uh, smoking or not getting enough exercise or using too much electronics, and we'll talk about this as well. But there's good news. The good news is that people at any age, at any point in your life, you can improve the quality of your sleep. And we don't have this discussion a lot. We don't have this conversation about the dangers of sleep. And there's so much um, dangerous impact that lack of sleep can have on both individuals and as societies. So uh, this is very important for us to have this conversation. So when we talk about aging well, aging well is really about prioritizing sleep. So ask yourself these questions. How many hours on average do you sleep per night? And do you feel rested throughout the day? Um, do you nap often? Do you have a sleep schedule? Um, these are just some questions to check in with ourselves. If you see that um, throughout the day you're feeling extra tired, you don't feel very rested, you have to nap very often, those are some indications that maybe you're not getting the best quality of sleep that your brain and your body desires. So there's a large myth out there that older adults don't need the same amount of sleep as younger adults, and that's very false. So older adults need the same amount of sleep as young adults, and that's about seven to nine hours of sleep every single night. This is non-negotiable. You need to give yourself um, this amount of sleep every single day, and this is very important. This is the restorative process for your brain and for your body. Um, so in research, we, we see this a lot, and there's a sleep scientist, his name is Dr. Matthew Walker, and he's a, a neuroscientist and a researcher at UC Berkeley, and he has this great quote that human beings are the only species that deliberately deprive themselves of sleep, and we deprive ourselves of sleep for no good reason. And um, a good example of a leader that deprived themselves of sleep was uh, Margaret Thatcher. It's been famously said that she slept only four to five hours per night. And she made her team uh, stay up along with her. She would make her team stay up until 2 to 3 a.m. writing speeches for her. And they would need to be awake just in time to listen to the BBC radio. And, you know, little is talked about the later stages of her life when she experienced minor strokes and she experienced dementia. Now, we can't say that it was lack of sleep. We don't know for sure that contributed to her lack of de uh, 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 cognitive decline and um, ultimately caused her dementia, but we do know that 
poor sleep or inadequate sleep can be detrimental to your brain, to your body, to your overall health and your quality of life. And we, to some extent, it's interesting because we tend to glorify lack of sleep. Um, and this is especially true for younger adults. Um, we, uh, to some extent, wear it as a badge of honor. And if you ask any motivational speaker or entrepreneur, what is the key to success? They will all say you need to wake up at 5 a.m. But little is talked about uh, quality sleep, deep sleep, and how you need to give yourself seven to nine hours of non-negotiable sleep every single night. So here are some benefits of deep sleep when it comes to our brains and our muscles. We see that when we get this good quality sleep, our muscles are relaxed. Blood supply to our muscles increases, there's tissue growth and um, repair occurs in our tissues. Energy is stored. We see that this strengthens our immune system and hormones are released. So this is why um, babies need a lot of sleep and they spend most of their time sleeping because they need to grow and develop their organs and their brains and their bones. So these are just some um, benefits of deep sleep. As you can see, the, the list goes on. Um, and of course, lack of sleep contributes to detrimental effects. So some benefits of deep sleep when it comes to the brain, you see that it enriches your ability to learn, memorize, and make logical decisions and choices. It influences our mood, energy levels, cognitive fitness, and it promotes the consolidation of experiences. So when individuals come in for a cognitive screening at Alzheimer's Orange County, we always assess to see how much sleep they got. Because if you did not get good quality sleep the night before and you come in for a memory screening, it's likely that you're not going to do very well because lack of sleep is going to contribute to um, memory changes and memory challenges. And it's going to affect um, your cognitive fitness. So we talk about how important it is to get good quality deep sleep. And we sleep in stages. So the two main stages of sleep are REM sleep and non-REM sleep. And this was, um, uh, this research was investigated in the 1950s at University of Chicago. So it's defined by their ocular features. So REM stands for rapid eye movement and non-REM is non-rapid eye movement. So I'm not sure that you might have seen this when someone is in deep quality sleep um, and their eyes are closed, you can kind of see their eyes rapidly going back and forth. So that's rapid eye movement. So this is where dreaming occurs. And this is a very deep level of sleep. And this is where you experience body paralysis. So you don't actually act out um, during your sleep in your dream stages. So this plays a very pivotal role in memory consolidation and memory formation. You also have your non-REM sleep. This is your dreamless sleep. And non-REM sleep actually has four different stages of sleep. And this is also very important. This is the stage where your body heals itself. And this is where you develop a strong immune system. So REM sleep and non-REM sleep. All adults need both stages of sleep and we go in between these cycles of sleep. So we need these two important stages for proper functioning. So let's talk about some tips for good night's sleep. Let's talk about some of the do's and don'ts. So it is very important for you to follow a regular sleep schedule. This means going to sleep at the same time every single day and waking up at the same time every single day, no matter if it's a weekend, if it's a weekday, if you're traveling, if you're on vacation. So a sleep schedule is very important because it's your sleep anchor. And it, uh, this consistency will make sure that you have good sleep hygiene throughout the rest of your life. So follow a regular sleep schedule. That's the number one tip. Develop a bedtime routine. Um, some of us have a bedtime routine. Some of us like to meditate or maybe we pray or we like to read a good book, um, a relaxing book. Maybe we like to listen to calm, soothing music, maybe soak up in a warm bath. 
Um, you do what works for you, but it's important to have a bedtime routine because you're training your brain, you're preparing your brain for sleep. So when you are engaging in your bedtime routine, you're sending signals to your brain that it's time to calm down, it's time to rest, um, and it's time to relax because you're preparing your brain and your body for sleep. Control the temperature in your room. This is an important one. So the ideal temperature in your room should be about 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's pretty cool. That's a cold temperature. And you may start to see this from experience that it's very difficult to fall asleep when it's hot. Um, so we try to keep our uh, temperature in the room cool. The reason we do this because our body temperatures actually need to cool down about two to three degrees for us to initiate sleep and to stay asleep. So um, always try to um, keep your temperature in the room cool. Um, you can do that with controlling the AC or opening windows, whatever you can to bring the temperature down. Use low lighting. Again, this is a very important one because when your room is brightly lit, you're sending mixed signals to your brain that it's time to be awake, it's time to be active, and this is you, um, um, disrupting your circadian, circadian rhythm, which is your inter, internal biological clock. So uh, bring down the lights as much as possible, uh, close the blinds, close the curtains. If you need to buy a, a curtain that um, it, you know gets rid of all the lights, you can do that. Um, it's very important for the room to be as dark as possible when you're trying to go to sleep. Exercise during the day, but not three hours before you go to sleep. So exercise, very important, but don't do it right before you go to sleep because that's going to disrupt your sleep schedule. So those are all the do's. Here are the don'ts. So don't nap in the late afternoon or evening. If you do have to nap, keep it short. Um, and we'll talk about uh, napping later on as well during the presentation. Don't use electronic devices right before bed, at least an hour before bed. Try to not use them. Don't keep it in the same room. Don't eat large meals late. Um, we all know this from experience. If you eat a large meal late, um, your body has to work twice as hard and it's sending, again, mixed signals to your brain and your body that you need to digest this food, you need to be awake, you need to be alert, and it's much harder for you to go to sleep with a full stomach. Don't consume caffeine late. Um, try not to drink caffeine um, after 1 p.m. And caffeine stays in your system for a very long time. So the effects can be there um, later on when you're trying to go to sleep and it's going to disrupt your sleep. Don't uh, drink alcohol. Some people believe that a glass of wine will help them to go to sleep. But um, in reality, this is just a placebo effect. It's making you think that you're actually getting good sleep. In reality, it's blocking your REM sleep, your rapid eye movement sleep. And this is that very important deep quality of sleep that your brain needs to restore and um, heal itself. So um, alcohol is a sedative and sedation does not equal to sleep. It's very important to keep that in mind. So ask yourself these questions. Are you getting enough sleep? To determine if you have an issue with sleep, think about the quality of time um, that you are awake. Are you feeling extra tired? Are you feeling fatigued? Are you feeling low energy? Those are all indications that maybe you're not getting good quality sleep. If you're noticing that lack of sleep is impacting your daily activities, um, your daily life, you should think about what is causing this. So it's important to have this dialogue and to talk about it. And think about what's keeping you what's keeping you up as we age there's physiological changes that can make it harder for us to sleep um, there's pain and this there's discomfort that's associated with different medical conditions maybe different medications that you're taking chronic conditions that can disrupt sleep so as we get older we tend to feel sleepy earlier in the evening so this may result in waking up early in the morning and changes in our um, shifts our hourly shifts so older adults have less REM sleep the REM rapid eye movement sleep and less slow wave sleep as a result of this this may impede memory consolidation. So if you are experiencing changes in your sleep cycle, this is very common. This can be quite normal, 
But again, if this is affecting your daily life, maybe it is time to maybe talk to a doctor, a sleep doctor about it, to see um, what exactly is causing these changes in your sleep patterns. But some changes in sleep can be quite normal for the aging process. Also, older adults um, are increasingly vulnerable to sleep uh, disturbances that can cause poor sleep. Um, and low brain oxygen. We talk about sleep apnea. This is a medical condition. It's characterized by uh, fatigue during the day. Uh, it's characterized by uh, pauses during sleep and sometimes even loud snoring. So sleep apnea is something that can also cause changes in your memory, in your cognition. And um, when individuals come in for memory screening, we talk about these treatable conditions because there are treatments available. There are things that you can do to um, take control of these um, problems and these issues and to um, get more good quality sleep. So some chronic sleep problems. Other questions you should be asking yourself, does it take you a long time? Long time generally is like 30 to 45 minutes or four or more to fall asleep? Do you wake up frequently during the night or wake up still feeling tired? Uh, personally, for me, this is a yes. I'm answering yes to all of these questions, but I know what my problem is and my problem is uh, electronic devices, right? This is a problem for a lot of people during this time, especially because we are working from home um, and we do have to be on our phones and our computers, our laptops, all the time. So asking, your, asking yourself these questions is a really great way to assess your sleeping habits. Um, insomnia and screen time. So uh, another reason why we should minimize our screen time as much as possible is because there are these sensory cells in our eyes. And when we are being exposed to ongoing light, LED light, blue light, it's sending mixed signals. It's tricking our brain into thinking that we need to be awake, we need to be alert, we need to be high functioning. So too much time on our phones, computers, and screens is very bad for us and make it very hard to go to sleep. Keep the bedroom calm, keep the bedroom quiet. Um, try to avoid having electronics in the bedroom. This is important because if you have your phone, if you have your computer, if you have your iPad in the same room when you're trying to go to sleep, you're likely to um, turn it on, take a look at it, check your email, check your Facebook. If you have your electronic devices in the other room, you're less likely to get up in the middle of the night, go into the other room and check your phones. So, so this is a good tip. If you're trying to improve your sleep, um, make sure you don't have any electronics in the same room. If you are using electronics, shut them down two hours before you intend to go to bed. This is important because if you want better sleep, you have to minimize your use of electronics. Again, we all have room for improvement in this area. So some tips for napping. So a lot of older adults nap and it's completely okay and it's completely normal, but you should try to sleep for less than an hour. If you try to sleep more than an hour, if your naps are hour and a half, two hours, not necessarily naps, right? And we talk about this circadian rhythm that we have. It's this natural internal process that regulates when we go to sleep, when we should wake up, so if you sleep for more than an hour, you're tricking your brain, you're tricking your body that it's time to go to sleep and you may actually shift your sleep-wake cycles. So bottom line here is to keep naps short. And naps earlier in the day before 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. are better for you compared to naps in the evening. Right, so you don't wanna disturb your sleep-wake cycles. Try to keep naps early in the afternoon um, and try to keep them very short. And sometimes power naps can be very helpful for you. Those are 15 to 20 minutes. If this is an option for you, this can be less disruptive to your normal sleep cycles. We have a question in the chat box um, from Marissa. She's saying, my father has dementia and sleeps very late. He has a very hard time waking up in the morning and likes to sleep from 11.30 to 12.30. He stated that he doesn't fall asleep when he goes to bed. Any advice? 
that's an interesting one. Let's come back to that at the end of the presentation because um, dementia can definitely affect an individual's sleep-wake cycles. Um, it's very important for us to practice good relaxation um, because when we relax, we are um, improving our quality of sleep. So relaxing not only helps you fall asleep once you are ready, it also can help you manage your stress throughout the day. Of course, acute small amounts of stress is good for us. It keeps us alert um, and it allows us to function normally. It's a normal everyday response to everyday stressors, but chronic stress can be bad for us. And it can um, have detrimental impacts to our quality of life and our health and our relationships. So here are some tips for relaxation. Um, take slow, deep breaths or try other breathing exercises for relaxation. Get that oxygen to your brain. Um, listen to soothing music if this is something that relaxes you. Practice mindful meditation, uh, prayer, keep a journal. Some people find writing about their feelings very helpful and soothing maybe yoga, uh, maybe watching uh, a movie, not uh, right before you go to bed and make sure that it's a movie that's going to uh, relax you. Maybe comedy, if, something that, if comedy is something that relaxes you because laughter can be very therapeutic. Those are just some ideas. So let's talk about managing other threats to brain health. So tobacco use, alcohol use disorder, sleep apnea, stress, hearing loss, these are all things that can um, affect our brain health, our cognitive health, and our sleep-wake cycles. So tobacco use, alcohol use, we talk about alcohol being uh, a sedative, and it's not going to give you good quality of sleep. It's going to give you the perception that you're getting maybe good night's sleep, but you're actually skipping that deep quality REM sleep that you need to function normally. Sleep apnea is a medical condition. We talk about how it's a disturbance, a lack of oxygen to the brain. Um, if you are starting to see signs of sleep apnea, it's very important for you to talk to your doctor about it because there are sleep ap machines, um, different interventions that can be helpful for you. Uh, stress, hearing loss, those are all things that can contribute to cognitive decline. So it's important for us to be mindful of what we're going through, what we're experiencing, to be able to seek the proper treatment. Here are some healthy ways to relax and recharge. Just some other ideas um, to alleviate any stress and to calm us down. Go for a walk. During the day, we talk about how, ex how beneficial exercise is, but try not to do do, to do that before you go to sleep. Um, don't exercise at least three hours before you go to sleep. Spend time in nature. Um, get uh, some uh, sunlight exposure during the day. And we also talk about how beneficial it is for individuals with dementia to um, get that sunlight exposure um, because that helps your internal biological clock and you're less likely to experience symptoms of sundowning. Um, call a good friend, release tension with a good workout, write in your journal. This is something that is soothing and therapeutic for you. Take a long bath, um, light scented candles, savor a warm cup of coffee or tea, play with a pet, work in your garden, get a massage. And I'm curious to see what other ways you exercise and what other ideas you have. So let me know in the chat box. Curl up with a good book, listen to music, watch a comedy. These are just some very basic ways to exercise and recharge. So if you're listening to this presentation and you're thinking, you know, there are things that I need to do to improve my sleep, um, it's all about small changes that will lead to big steps. So engaging in a healthy lifestyle, it, requ it requires preparation, it requires goal setting, and you need to pick one thing that in each area that will help you to improve your brain health. So we talk about SMART goals. When you are writing your goals, make sure that it is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic and time bound. For example, a not, a not so smart goal is I will sleep better. 
or I will exercise more, right? There, there's no set time on that. There's no objective. You don't know what directions you need to follow. There's no actionable items. So your goals need to be very specific. For example, I will walk 15 minutes, three times per week for the next two weeks, or I will eat one serving of vegetables four days out of the week for the next four weeks, right? So you get the idea here. You need to be very specific. And if you write SMART goals, you're more likely to act on your goals. So write down what you will do and when you will do it and keep track of your progress and don't give up, right? These things take practice. And if you, uh, um, if you skip a day, don't quit, encourage yourself, empower yourself and celebrate your progress. Okay, so I think we'll be finishing a bit early. There's a couple other things that I wanted to talk about. Um, there's this uh, myth out there that melatonin supplements will help you to sleep better. So melatonin is a natural hormone that's secreted by our pineal glands, which are these small pea-sized glands just above the center of our brains. So melatonin uh, supplements, the research in that area is actually not very encouraging. So researchers and sleep doctors believe that this, again, is due to the placebo effect, where you have this perception that um, it's, it's helping you. In reality, it's blocking that REM sleep, that deep quality of sleep that your brain desires. So um, overall, melatonin um, it doesn't give you that natural restorative sleep that your brain desires. And sleep pills um, also along the same line of research, for example, Ambien, that's a very po um, popular uh, sleep pill. It doesn't produce the naturalistic sleep, the restorative sleep. It just gives you the idea and the perception that you are getting good sleep. Again, that placebo effect that we talk about. And research shows us that um, sleep doctors and sleep scientists, they actually don't prescribe a lot of these medications. And I think that says a lot. So there's not a lot of consensus around this area because sleep is very complex and we have not yet designed these complex medications and supplements to give us that deep quality of sleep that we need. So um, a great resource that I wanted to provide to you is the UCI Health Sleep um, medicine. It's a clinic that treats a wide variety of sleep issues and disorders. So if you're listening to this presentation and um, you think you are experiencing insomnia or sleep apnea, I would highly encourage you to consult with UCI Health Sleep Medicine and they do a variety of treatments and um, interventions and they will help to pinpoint what exactly is causing dis disturbances in your sleep and what you can do to improve your quality of sleep. So I guess the overall um, um, message that we can all leave um, today with is that sleep is essential for every single organ in our bodies. Um, it's the single most effective thing that we can 